Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Studying Protein Polymerization with Mass Photometry. I am Morgan Sterling of LabRoots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Refine. To learn more, visit refine.com. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits after the webinar. We do encourage you to participate in today's event by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well um, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd now like to welcome our speaker, Nicholas Hunt, postdoctoral research associate, Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. Nicholas, you may now begin your presentation. Yeah, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, and uh, I would like to thank Refine at this point for sponsoring this webinar. And um, I would like to thank all of you for your interest in my webinar. I would say let's jump right into it. You've all probably heard in one or the other way about these proteins that I've listed here. They are all biopolymers, um, which are involved in many different uh, important cellular processes. For example, uh, up there you see actin and microtubules, which are an essential part of the cytoskeleton, uh, and they are basically involved in all the processes where, cell, where cells need to uh, change their shape uh, or move, uh, for example, for um, uh, yeah, production of cell protrusions or cell uh, migration, cell division, and so on. Um, and then there's another group uh, of common biopolymers, which are called amyloids. Um, they are actually uh, not one type of protein, but many different ones. And um, amyloids are rather a structural state of um, proteins, where proteins form um, polymeric beta sheets. Uh, and then uh, from this over time, form three-dimensional structures, which are called fibrils. And they are important for a number of very prominent disorders. They're usually, usually associated with the progression of the disease. Uh, the, um, the, uh, the examples that, uh, that I've listed here are, for example, important for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, diabetes, and Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease. In order to understand the regulation of all these processes, it's of course crucial to uh, understand uh, how these polymers are formed. And um, how do you actually study the assembly of a biopolymer? Well, you can start off by understanding uh, what your polymer looks like structurally, for example. Um, for this, you can employ high resolution techniques such as uh, x-ray crystallography or uh, cryo uh, cryo electron microscopy and this way you can for example uh, uh, obtain atomic structures of your mon monomeric subunits as well as the um, the, poly the polymerized state of your protein but of course um, looking at only the structure will not uh, tell you much about how the polymerization process is regulated and how it actually um, functions dynamically. So um, if you want to learn something about the polymerization process dynamically, you will probably go to um, a less resolution um, uh, technique, uh, usually uh, microscopy, light microscopy techniques are employed for this. Um, very common is fluorescence microscopy, where you label the individ some individual subunits of your polymer with a fluorescent dye, and then you can watch individual polymers grow and shrink over time. This is very useful to get like basic kinetic constants for the growth and shrinkage out, um, as well as to understand how, for example, uh, regulators uh, um, influence this process. But 
uh, for the regulation, it's not only uh, in, interesting or important to look at the, um, the uh, overall polymerization process, but it's also uh, important to understand how the polymerization process starts. And there it becomes a lot more difficult to assess this, uh, this, this initial part of the assembly because um, we cannot employ um, so easily these uh, optical techniques anymore. And up until now, it's actually very, it's actually common to explore this process just with bulk techniques. And typically um, a bulk polymerization assay um, uses different kinds of bulk um, signals such as fluorescence, scattering, viscosity, or biofringence measurements um, to follow uh, the, um, the accumulation of the polymer over time in solution. And um, this polymeric, uh, uh, this um, polymerization signal um, can usually be subdivided into in three different phases. The first one is called the nucleation phase where the line stays mostly flat. This is where the, um, the polymerization is usually started. Uh, then you go into the elongation phase where the signal will rise uh, much more quickly. And this is where uh, the, the major portion of the polymers is formed. And then later on, you enter a stationary phase uh, where polymer growth um, comes to an end and uh, enters more like a steady state where growth and shrinkage um, is, is more or less in equilibrium. Um, now, uh, from, from these polymerization curves, especially if you do them at different polymer concentrations, you can uh, deduce somewhat um, rates for the initial steps as well as um, uh, a, an overall polymerization rate. Um, but as you, uh, as you might guess, since uh, this nucleation phase actually just happens in this flat regime of the curve, there's not much information really about the molecular pathway uh, that underlies this polymerization process. Uh, and, uh, and usually um, you have to uh, come up with a kinetic model um, and uh, try to simulate your uh, bulk polymerization curves based on that kinetic model. And this is how we figure out um, different uh, molecular pathways uh, during the nucleation process. Um, for actin, the first models have come up in the uh, 1960s and 70s. And um, these uh, nucleation models have, have been refined over, over, the, uh, over the decades. Uh, up until um, 2001, where I think, in, uh, well, in my opinion, the most detailed model came out for, for actin polymer uh, nucleation. Um, David Sept and Andrew McCammon uh, tried to um, simulate all possible nucleation pathways for actin based on a di um, Brownian dynamic simulation. And essentially how, um, what, uh, what they did was um, as you can see on the left, uh, the, the actin uh, polymer consists of, a, uh, of two helical strands, the blue one and the red one. And uh, each actin subunit can have contacts to the neighboring longitudinal subunits uh, in the same strand, as well as a, a cross filament contact uh, <coughs> with the subunits on the other strand, basically. And, uh, and then they've um, they've essentially uh, simulated uh, how stable all the possible combinations um, of nuclei were based on uh, based on their uh, Brownian dynamics, and uh, figured out a major pathway in which this nucleation process should happen, which is encircled with a dashed line here. So. Um, uh, basically, you can have two different dimers uh, was their conclusion, which are relevant. One is the longitudinal dimer and the cross filament dimer. And, um, and, then, um, and then they figured out uh, growth, uh, like association and dissociation rates, as well as dissociation constants for each of these steps. And their major conclusion was that the uh, rate limiting step is the formation of a dimer and uh, once the system has reached um, a, a trimeric state 
afterwards all the subsequent steps are more or less uh, working in the same way with the same rate constants and then then they use this model um, and sca uh, scale their theoretical rate constants to experimentally determined ones and compare their predicted bulk scattering curves with um, experimental ones and found uh, that their model uh, would explain it quite well and they could even um, determine time courses for for the individual uh, different uh, nucleation species over over time but unfortunately up until now um, this uh, theoretical model could not be confirmed experimentally and you uh, you would ask yourself why is why is that the case that after uh, more than 20 years um, it was not possible to reproduce this experimentally well how would you measure this essentially the simple task would be to quantify all polymer species dynamically using single molecule imaging Well, yeah, um, I mean, who has ever tried um, to uh, uh, to quantify this experimentally, for example, with um, single molecule fluorescence imaging, knows that this is a pretty hard task to do, um, uh, if, especially if there are spe more species than just a couple. But fortunately, more recently, um, we introduced a new uh, microscopy technique uh, called mass photometry, which is designed to do exactly that task. And uh, since you're sitting in this webinar, you're probably uh, familiar with the technique, but still I will go through the basic principle very quickly. So you shine a laser onto a uh, cover slip, um, uh, which, which holds a droplet of your protein solution. And um, and then you record the light that come uh, that that, uh, that comes back um, onto a camera, and uh, the light that comes back in this uh, case is a combination of the reflected light from the water glass interface and the scattered light from little objects that are sitting on that interface, and um, the <laughs> reflected light creates a bright background. And uh, wherever a particle is sitting on the surface, um, the scattered light will uh, generate a small inter uh, destructive interference. And uh, si uh, hence, you will see kind of a, a dark dip at that position. And the darkness of that dip is directly proportional to the size of your uh, particle that you're looking at. And um, you can uh, calibrate that signal using proteins of known size. And uh, since, every, since all the proteins have very similar uh, optical properties, you can basically um, get a, a mass distribution uh, of your proteins that land on, a, on the glass cover slip. And I've done this for actin, for example, and this is a, a, a mass photometry video that shows uh, actin uh, molecules landing on a glass cover slip. So every time you see a dark dot, that's a landing event. And the reason why they appear and disappear is just because we continuously um, remove the static background. So once a particle has landed, it becomes static on the background and gets removed by the um, image processing algorithm. This way we can, um, we can image all the uh, the proteins that are coming in uh, one after the other and analyze their um, their darkness basically and then when you plot uh, the darknesses or the masses of all your molecules that you have in your video in a histogram you can generate uh, a size distribution of the protein um, and uh, and get an impression of uh, what what type of molecules and how many are in, uh, present in solution. And uh, this is very powerful because um, so, uh, the, uh, the mass resolution with mass photometry is so high that we can actually distinguish the different oligomeric states as individual uh, mass peaks in the size distribution. And now uh, uh, this, uh, this is also very useful for the quantification of uh, the initial um, uh, yeah, a polymerization reaction 
since this is exactly what we needed, uh, what I um, talked about before. And you can also do that. Um, you can also do that uh, as a timed experiment. And uh, the way the way I've done it, I, um, I I've taken a, a monomeric actin solution, added the polymerization status, uh, let the polymerization incubate for a while, and after different time points, I pipetted some uh, uh, some sample out of that um, uh, uh, out of that polymerizing solution into a um, cover slip with a droplet of buffer and um, uh, and immediately watched landing of the molecules that have had formed after these different time points. And if you then compare the mass distributions um, of different acting concentrations at different time points, you will see that if you're working <coughs> at or below the um, uh, the critical concentration of filament formation, which is the red curve, uh, there's not significant, um, there's not a significant difference um, uh, at the different time points. But if you work above the critical concentration, the equilibrium shifts to larger mo uh, molecular masses. And this can be uh, crucially quantified by um, taking the area under the curve of this histogram uh, and as you can see, as I said before, like um, uh, beyond the critical concentration, you get growth essentially, and um, uh, below the critical concentration, uh, the mass distribution stays more more or less constant. But this is really a ju just a very crude analysis. The the actual advantage of this uh, lies in the fact that we can quantify principally every individual. Um, species that is present during the polymerization process um, individually and uh, take a time course of it. And the way I've done it, um, I, uh, I, I, I took the, um, yeah, the, the size distribution and uh, used a combination of Gaussian fitting uh, plus uh, for, for the well-defined peaks and uh, just bin, a simple binning uh, for the less well-defined peaks uh, for the higher masses and um, determined um, molecule counts for each oligomer size. And this can, since I know the overall con concentration of actin, can be directly converted into concentrations of, of each of these species. And from, from the Gaussian fit, um, I can uh, I also know some parameters from the experiment. So in principle, from from any of these oligomer size distributions and uh, and counts, I can recreate based on the um, fit position of the peaks, as as well as as the width of the peaks, uh, which corresponds to the uh, to the uh, mass noise. Basically, I can regenerate a, um, mass dis, uh, a simulated mass distribution, which I can directly compare with my, um, with my experimental histogram. And this, this is all I need to essentially now test all the models that are out there um, and compare them with my mass photometry measurements. So I took the Sepp McCammon model and simplified it a little bit by by just breaking it down to the main pathway because all the other pathways are so unlikely that they don't really contribute to the overall kinetics so essentially i i took the um uh, uh, i took the uh, the um, formation of the longitudinal dimer and then from there um the uh, uh, yeah the pathway to the trimer tetramer and uh, all the subsequent steps and uh, use the uh, rate constants that are provided in this paper. And then um, I needed to, uh, to solve a, a couple of, or um, yeah, derive a couple of differential equations to describe this equilibrium, basically in order to uh, be able to create um, yeah, uh, time courses for the concentration of each individual species. The only assumptions I made was I had to limit the number of um, possible species to an infinite number, which in my case was 400, um, because otherwise I couldn't um, uh, compute this. 
uh, and I had made the assumption that every um, uh, that every step would just be by the addition of a monomer and not bigger species. And then um, one one last thing I needed was a starting distribution uh, for which I took the um, the experimentally determined one at one minute. And then I let my simulation run. And from the uh, concentration time course, I could pick uh, the five minutes, 10 minutes, and 15 minutes time point like I did uh, in my experiment. And re recreated from my from my uh, time uh, from my uh, concentration time course uh, an uh, experimental histogram uh, that I could compare with my uh, mass photometry data. And as you can see here, uh, the SEP McCammon model predicts uh, overall net growth uh, over the course of the 15 minutes uh, to uh, masses up to uh, seven megadalton. But in the low mass regime. It actually predicts um, almost no abundance of dimers and trimers because they are uh, incredibly unstable according to their model. But if you um, if you remember my experimental data, there were actually quite significant amounts of these uh, small oligomers. So the um, the simulated traces uh, didn't match at all my uh, experimental mass photometry data. I can I can do the same. Um, I can use the same simulation to also produce artificial bulk uh, scattering curves, uh, which I did and uh, and compared it to an experimental measurement. And here I actually um, kind of could uh, recreate uh, a very like a very similar curve, um, uh, which means that uh, the Sepp McCammon model explains the data in the bulk but uh, it could not explain my mass photometry data. So my first um, attempt to, uh, to, uh, uh, yeah, to, to overcome this problem, I tried to adjust the rate constants of the model until my uh, experimental data and, uh, and the uh, size distribution perfectly matched. But then I had the, the issue that I didn't observe any net growth uh, into long filaments, as you can see in the in the top uh, time course of the distributions. And also, uh, there was uh, the light scattering curve was just a flat line, basically. Huh, this was this was a bit puzzling because um, that that meant that the common model could not explain um, at the same time my uh, my bulk data and the mass photometry data. So I stepped back and thought again about what these nucleation models uh, were considering. And I noticed that they weren't really considering all the information that is out there about actin. So uh, first of all, actin is a, um, is a um, polar uh, polymer, which means that one end is different from the other end. Um, and the, the different ends have different um, uh, uh, association and dissociation rate constants. This is something that uh, these models haven't considered so far. And also, we know that actin is an ATPase, which means um, usually act, uh, ATP actin gets preferentially incorporated at the barbed end of the filament. And then once it's incorporated, it can uh, cleave uh, ATP into ADP and phosphate and then later on release the phosphate and the ADP actin then preferentially leaves the filament through the, uh, through the pointed end. And the, the common nucleation models uh, completely disregarded this fact so far. So I, I thought, okay, maybe I can um, modify my model a little bit and um, produce a simple model where I have one equilibrium um, where uh, the, the filament can grow from both ends. And then I noticed that um, ADPPI actin has almost, uh, has a really slowed down dissociation rate at the pointed end, which means that essentially um, if, uh, if the, um, the final subunit at the pointed end uh, cleaves its, uh, hydrolyzes its ATP, um, it will stop depolymerizing from that end, um, and uh, so so essentially, I I, uh, I have a, a sm slow transition um, 
from from this top equilibrium to the bottom equilibrium with different rate constants. When I plugged uh, this uh, into my simulation, I actually got very different curves out. And uh, in fact, um, just using published rate constants for the uh, polymerization and depolymerization rates from the barbed and pointed ends um, already uh, almost perfectly recreated my experimental data in the low mass regime. Plus I got net growth and uh, could actually um, describe uh, the, this, uh, the bulk scatter scattering curves much better than before. And um, to confirm, I did, uh, I used the same um, uh, kinetic rate constants and simulated data for different actin concentrations. And in all the cases, I could explain my experimental data fairly well with, uh, with this new model. So I think this, this worked pretty well, but there was still a drawback. And um, actually this came, um, uh, especially during the review of the paper. In fact, um, if, if uh, ATP hydrolysis um, is the actual trigger of actin polymerization. How come that um, actin can still polymerize without ATP hydrolysis? For example, you can replace ATP with a non hydrolyzable uh, ATP homolog, uh, AMP, PNP, and you would still get filaments. And also, you can uh, polymerize uh, uh, actin just from ADP actin. And there have been papers that you can polymerize actin um, with, uh, with no nucleotide at all. So, okay, how, how can we explain this? Um, in fact, um, actin can also bind, um, usually for, for polymerization, um, actin uh, needs to bind divalent cations. And um, in order to keep it uh, monomeric, actin is usually kept in a calcium solution. And then for, um, for polymerization, you exchange the calcium for magnesium. And calcium actin has different uh, polymerization rate constants than magnesium actin. So in fact, I tested what happens um, if I um, do a mass photometry experiment with AMP, PNP actin, and then uh, use the rate constants for calcium actin and magnesium actin and the exchange rate uh, with the same kind of model on that data. And in fact, um, I could explain the data that I got out again very well. And um, I even observed that uh, ATP actin would give me um, a lower amplitude in my bulk polymerization curves than the AMP PNP actin. And the simulation with this model could even explain the discrepancy in the, the amplitudes in these two different experiments. Um, yeah, so now finally, um, you might ask yourself, why um, do, do the, um, the results in the bulk of the nucleation models and these new completely different models actually look so similar? Well, in fact, this is mostly because the, the two principles, the kinetic principles, are almost the same, in my opinion. For the nucleation model, you have one equilibrium um, with a, a less favorable um, uh, with a less favorable um, polymerization, um, which uh, which which is described by a steeper decay. Um, in the, uh, in the size distribution at the beginning of the size distribution, and then a slow transition to a second equilibrium, which with, with much more favorable um, growth rates, uh, which can be explained by the, by the other half of the, um, and the, the, the other slope of the, um, uh, of the size distribution. In the new model, it's basically the same, you have one equilibrium, uh, which is explained by the uh, by the first half of the um, of the size distribution and a higher slope in in the decay of of the species, 
and a slow transition to a second equilibrium, which is more favorable for growth. And I think um, uh, these, uh, this principle uh, is, is the reason for, um, for the shape of these bulk polymerization curves. But of course, on a molecular level, they work uh, in a, with co two completely different pathways. And um, uh, you, can, you can even, uh, and we, ev we even identified two different pathways for actin. One, um, one was the calcium to magnesium transition. If you, if you look at it uh, from a more thermodynamic point of view, you can say the calcium state has a less favorable um, Gibbs free energy of polymerization and the magnesium state has a more favorable one. And then the, in pathway two, um, actin um, changes its uh, uh, yeah, Gibbs free energy of polymerization to a more favorable one by ATP hydrolysis. And uh, in both cases, you can generate net elongation of actin filaments. Well, I do think that uh, this doesn't have to stop just at actin. Um, in, in, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are these, um, uh, these amyloid fibrils, uh, which are very important for the, um, uh, for the generation of different diseases. And in particular, uh, nowadays it's, uh, uh, it's thought that, um, that the onset of these polymerization reactions are the actual uh, cytotoxic events that, uh, that are relevant for the, uh, uh, for the progression of the disease. And therefore, it, uh, it, uh, since, since these uh, systems lack uh, the same uh, methodology for investigating the small oligomers, I think mass photometry can really help to gain more insights into, uh, 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 yeah, into these disease uh, mechanisms. Finally, I would like to thank a couple of people, especially um, my uh, previous lab mates from the Kukura lab in Oxford. They are uh, an amazing group of people and they are really good uh, microscope builders. Um, Without them, it would have never been possible to uh, image and, uh, and do mass photometry on actin uh, at this quality. I would also like to thank my collaborators from Oxford who helped me a lot in the data analysis uh, and also Josiah Kane from Refine who helped me uh, with data analysis and um, our collaborators from the NIH, Jim Sellers and Harry Takagi who provided me with the raw material for producing actin and finally, I would like to thank my new supervisor, Claudia Feigl here in Munich, uh, who gives me the opportunity to explore um, amazing new um, uh, avenues for applying mass photometry. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nicholas, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Um, just click on the Ask a Question box located at the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So the first question that came up, Nicholas, was, what sophomore that you software that you used for analyze nucleation model and is that free? Um, yeah, so I I produced the the analysis software myself. I mean, for for producing the uh, mass distributions, of course, I just used the the normal refined software. Sorry, I need to go on that side. Um, uh, I used the normal uh, ref, uh, ma um, the normal refined software for creating the um, the uh, mass distributions, but um, the um, the software for analyzing and simulating the mass distributions I created myself in in a Python package, and uh, it is free, uh, freely available. Um, if you check out uh, the um, my publication in Science Advances, um, then uh, you will find a link to a um, uh, to a repository. And I put all the code on there so you can download it if you like. Great. 
And is time travel possible using mass spectrometry? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Not yet. Great. Um, and then we have a bit of a situation here. So someone said that they used MP to study Huntington fusion protein, but while the protein had a nominal mass of 58 kDa, using the collaboration curve, it came out to be calculated as 74 kDa, which is significantly different than a predicted 5% error. Can this difference be attributed by the expanded glutamines or something else that isn't clear? Good question. From, yeah, from just this, it's hard to tell, I must say. Um, are you sure there was nothing else in the sample? I mean, um, if, if it, I mean, it could be if there, if there is a, a if you co-purify a binding partner for um, the Huntington fusion protein, maybe, maybe, maybe it sticks to the protein or something, or maybe a chaperone or something that, uh, because if, of course, if you, if you would detect the complex that could explain why you get a, a, a mass increase. Um, I don't know if you, if you like, you can uh, get in touch with me. Maybe I can, we can have a look at the data together and, uh, and I might help you uh, resolve that issue. Next question. Um, excellent work, Nicholas. Would you be able to tell how well MP is compatible with high 300 mm NACI concentrations? Oh yeah, so that's not a problem actually. I've I've used even higher uh, sodium chloride concentrations. The only um, difference for higher salt concentration is that the buffer then has a different refractive index than at lower salt concentrations. So if you do your mass calibration, you should always use the same buffer and same salt concentration as you use for your um, pro protein of interest. Um, because yeah, the, the slope of the mass calibration might be slightly different at these high salt concentrations. Great. And how did mass photometry help you resolve biases with kinetic model overfitting? Yeah, so I think uh, the, the main uh, advantage of, uh, of mass photometry for um, yeah, for these polymerization reactions is really that you can quantify the, um, the, the amount of small um, species that are present during the polymerization process. And that way, it's, it's a lot easier um, to find a molecular pathway for the reaction than just using bulk um, uh, methods. Awesome. And Nicholas, are there any drawbacks to, <clears throat> excuse me, using mass photometry compared to classical bulk based method methods? Yeah. Um, yes, I, I would say there is because um, I mean, most actin uh, experiments so far have been done at much higher concentrations as as you might have noticed the concentration that i've been working with were already quite high for mass photometry um, but i had to because the critical concentration of uh, actin is uh, 120 nanomolar and that's already fairly high but in order to see something i had to go higher than this um, and the way I overcome this problem in my case was that I that I um, put a droplet of buffer onto my cover slip beforehand, and then I diluted my actin solution into that droplet and hoped that that the complexes uh, that were forming didn't fall apart during the time of the acquisition. Um, that's that's how I had to do it in this case. So I think one of the major drawbacks. Um, for these kind of polymerization reactions is really uh, that you that you might not um, get uh, to the concentrations that you need to for polymer formation. Great. And it looks like we have one more question. Um, if anyone has any more questions, go ahead and ask them now.
Um, the next question for you, Nicholas, is how does mass photometry compare to other single molecule techniques for the study of protein polymerization? Did you consider using any of these other techniques? Um, not in particular for the actin polymerization. I think the the reason why there has never been really a, um, an experimental uh, study single molecule uh, like single molecule study on actin nucleation is because it's super difficult with other techniques for example if you would be using something like uh, single molecule uh, fluorescence um, and do uh, something like stepwise photo bleaching and so on we would probably be able to detect the um, the dimers and trimers that we've seen with mass photometry but it is much, much harder to quantify these. And especially, um, um, uh, especially for, for, for this huge number of different species, I think it's really hard with uh, especially fluorescence techniques to uh, get the same quality of data that we got with mass photometry. Awesome. Great. Well, looks like that wraps up our questions. Um, thank you, Nicholas, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Refine, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for or if something else comes up. Um, in the on-demand period, we will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Um, this webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We do encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, thank you, Nicholas, and goodbye. Thank you, goodbye.